Go. So good uh, evening, everybody in Europe, and uh, good afternoon for the people in the US. So it's um, it's a great pleasure, or it's a great it's great that you're all here back uh, in the uh, in our seminar series or our colloquium series on Tensor Networks. So um, it's a great pleasure to introduce uh, my colleague Jutto Hageman from Ghent University uh, today. So Jutto has been uh, um, instrumental in the new way of, of, of looking at actually Tensor Network algorithms in terms of uh, tangent spaces, in terms of this TDVP, in terms of trying to understand excitations. And this has led to uh, uh, an extremely kind of a fruitful and uh, interesting kind of, of, of whole new area of, of applications of, of these Tensor Networks. Dito is also one, uh, is also the, the main author of, of one of the state of the art open source packages for doing uh, Tensor Network simulations. Uh, so he's very fond of, uh, of, of Julia and uh, has kind of made wonderful work there. So, uh, so I, I suggest everybody should to look at that. Uh, but uh, let's just give the word to Yuto, uh, who will speak about resolving Fermi surfaces with tensor networks. Yuto, the stage is yours. Okay, thank you, Frank, for uh, the kind introduction. Um, yes, yeah, so I want to talk about um, this work that we did in uh, collaboration with Quentin Morty, so a PhD student. Um, and um, I'll do the switch to the next slide like this. Uh, PhD student in our group, in our quantum group in Ghent, and then also uh, actually two of the organizers of this seminar, Norbert and Frank. Um, so this is a paper from this summer, but actually uh, we gained quite a few new insights since then, and I hope that there will be a new version uh, on the archive soon. Um, so what will I talk about? Well, um, I will start with an introduction. Um, I don't think I have to give a general tensor network introduction in this uh, seminar series. Uh, I will remind everybody about uh, the status of tensor networks for critical systems, uh, and then briefly mention um, how to work with fermions. And in particular, uh, in this talk, we will actually restrict to free fermions uh, because well, that's sufficient and also very easy to understand the physics of Fermi surfaces. Um, we will then look at um, Kitaev's Majorana chain as a kind of uh, warming up uh, stage, as a kind of benchmark for our methods. And it will um, turn out that this is already very um, interesting to give us some insights. And then uh, we will switch to 2D where we will look at Fermi surfaces, but actually also at regular Fermi points or in fact, Dirac points um, in two dimensional quantum systems. Um, it will turn out that there are in some cases certain obstructions which have some kind of topological um, reason under, underneath. Uh, so we will uh, spend some uh, attention on that and finally some conclusions and outlook. Um, before we start a small advertisement, so actually Frank already mentioned this, we have been developing several um, software packages, open source software packages in the group. Um, so you can actually find these, well, they are all on GitHub. There's an easy way to find uh, what these different packages are and what they do is by going to um, our website, which is, uh, well, very new, it's uh, I think a few weeks old, um, and go to the top software and there you can find a description. Uh, so there are four main tensing network packages and then a whole lot of auxiliary packages uh, that might also be useful. Uh, things like, um, well, packages with methods for doing the manual optimization, packages with iterative uh, Krilov methods and these kind of things. Uh, and so it's uh, all our open source software so far is indeed, as Frank mentioned, uh, using this uh, Julia programming language. Now the talk of today will actually be mostly an analytical talk while well, there are numerics involved, but uh, these uh, are of a different kind and therefore we're not done using any of these packages. Okay, so tensor networks, uh, mainly we will be talking about projected entangled pair states or PEPs. 
um, which in one dimension, actually the same construction reduces to matrix product states. I think they are familiar to all of, all of you. Um, and so what these uh, particular families of states have is they, have, they exhibit an area law of entanglement scaling. And therefore they're also assumed to be uh, good representatives for states which indeed have this particular type of entanglement scaling. And this turns out to be um, gapped ground states of local Hamiltonians. And in, in one dimension, there are indeed many rigorous results. Uh, I'd like to uh, list some of the main authors involved in, in um, various proofs, various uh, bounds on how well um, you can approximate a given state with certain properties in terms of gaps, in terms of entanglement um, with, with a matrix product state approximation. And of course, there are not only rigorous results, there are uh, an, almost unlimited number of numerical confirmations uh, by applying DMRT over the um, past uh, almost 30 years. Um, so this is for gap states. Um, well, and then in, in 2D, the rigorous results are, are well, mostly lacking. There are, there are some results. Uh, but what do we know there about the power of PEPs for representing states? Um, well, certainly they contain product states for so the most uh, trivial uh, states in, in all respects, in particular they are topologically trivial. Uh, and, and by extension, we expect that uh, PEPs are good to um, describe any kind of short range entangled state. Um, then we also know that the levin one string nets have an exact PEPs representation. And therefore we also expect that uh, in these phases, if you would perturb away from the renormalization group fixed point, uh, there you would also find a good, um, good PEPs representation. And so these levin one string nets are known to, uh, to capture all non-chiral topological order states, at least of bosonic systems or spin systems in two dimensions. Um, there are actually some exact uh, PEPs descriptions of scale invariant states or critical states, but these are of a very uh, particular nature. Uh, they are related to 2D classical uh, criticality. So this is this uh, rockshard kivelson construction or these quantum Lifshitz critical points. And then there are um, the last, uh, I guess it's now more than five years already, six, seven years. Um, there have been constructions of, of, of certain chiral states by, well, various people, and I'm certainly forgetting uh, some of them, but uh, Dubai, Reed, Torsten Weil, Hong Ha Tu, Norbert Schuch, Ignacio Sirac, Didier Paul Blanc, and collaborators. On the other hand, there's actually by Dubai and Reed also a no go theorem, um, on which I will not go into. We will certainly um, return on this topic of, of chiral states throughout the talk, even though it's not uh, our main focus, or at least not, it was not our main um, goal of, of, of studying chiral states, but it will turn out that we will actually need uh, some of it. So how about tensor networks and critical states? Um, I will not talk about the, the multi-scale entanglement renormalization ansatz here, which was particularly built for describing critical states, but rather um, just to remind uh, the audience of, of um, how one can use, um, or whether one can use, uh, one can use um, uh, projected entanglement pair states and matrix product states for, for critical points. So in one dimension, most critical points um, seem to have a low energy description, which uh, is that of a conformal field theory. Um, there are, of course, exceptions. Uh, those with the dynamic criti dynamical critical exponent uh, larger than one, of which, uh, which appeared in one of the previous uh, talks in the seminar. Uh, but for those described by a conformal field theory, there is this well-known formula for the bipartite entanglement entropy uh, as a function of the system size. Uh, and you see that, well, uh, as the system size increases, this entanglement uh, is unbounded. So um, we expect that with the finite bond dimension, we will not be able to capture uh, such states in the thermodynamic limit. 
Um, so finite bond dimension implies finite entanglement. And then um, it turns out that this finite entanglement actually gives rise to a finite correlation length. Um, so there are some of the authors uh, below here. Um, and so that in, 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 in that sense, uh, finite bond dimension or just finite entanglement behaves like a finite system size, even if you would study the system in the thermodynamic limits, but you study it with matrix product states. Uh, and so you can, um, well, you can ask two questions. So one is how does the complexity scale uh, as a function of the system size? And then, um, well, so when will your MPS provide a good description of the critical state at a finite system? Uh, for this, well, you want this correlation length implied by the bond dimension to be larger than, than the actual system size. So a bond dimension roughly of this order uh, should probably be sufficient to capture the correct state at finite size. Um, and so what you see is that uh, this is still, um, so even though it grows with the system size, it's still much better than for a completely random state where you would have an exponential complexity and system size. So still this can be called efficient. It's a, it's a polynomial or a power law scaling in the system size. Um, but you can also just choose to um, not work in this finite size scaling regime to work in, in determine dynamic limits um, and then replace basically the finite length scale that, is, that you know from finite size scaling uh, with the correlation length that you get from this finite entanglement um, and, and develop a theory of finite entanglement scaling, introduce a universal scaling hypothesis. And this uh, well has been improved over the, the past few years and, and is becoming more and more powerful uh, every day. So this uh, seems to be a very fruitful way of, of studying critical systems with matrix product states. So what is the situation in 2D? Um, so the entanglement scaling at 2D quantum uh, critical points uh, for most or for typical critical points, uh, the entanglement would have would scale like the boundary of, the, of, of some region. So you have your, your area allowed that you also have in gap states, but there would be some logarithmic um, corrections to this. Um, for this, um, you expect um, that PEPs behave in the same way as, as, as uh, they do in, 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 as MPS do in, in 1D, that you cannot really capture the, the critical behavior um, with finite bond dimension, but that at least you can develop uh, a, a scaling uh, hypothesis and, and, and that you can study these critical points in a scaling regime. Uh, and indeed, there have been some, some first results and uh, which, which look very uh, promising in this direction. Um, Fermi surfaces uh, is a different kind of criticality, which seems to lead to a multiplicative correction to this, um, to this ILO. And so it's um, a valid question and our main motivation um, to um, to ask whether indeed PEPs can capture this kind of criticality and this kind of entanglement scaling. Uh, not exactly, of course, but in some kind of, of, of uh, efficient limit. Um, okay, and so to study uh, Fermi surfaces, um, well, we can ask two questions. First is, uh, well, are the fermions themselves a problem? This, of course, is, is, is well known. I mean, uh, plenty of papers using fermions uh, or using PEPs for studying fermionic systems. Uh, there have been extensive studies of the Hubbard model, for example, by, by uh, Philip Corbos. So um, there are in fact uh, different formulations of how to, how to apply PEPs to, uh, to fermionic systems, which are more or less equivalent, not exactly. I think uh, the oldest one was probably in 2010. I think I... Uh, well, I decided not to put references here because there are just already so many, but uh, I think the oldest approaches were using swap gates. I think this was already with Philip Corbos involved and, and Frank and uh, Kifri Vital, I guess. There are proposals with Grassmann numbers. I think uh, people like uh, Gu and Wen, 
uh, Cooper uh, have, have used these kind of ansatzes. Um, a more recent proposal that, that came from our Gantt group, I think, was to use this concept of graded vector spaces. Um, there are probably other variations still, but in the end, they're not that different. Um, okay, so that's for general interacting fermionic systems. But actually, to study Fermi surfaces, uh, that's that's very easy already in free or well, this kind of physics. Uh, is already present in, in, in free fermion systems. And there, of course, it's particularly easy to uh, identify a Fermi surface in just um, zero modes in the, in the single particle Hamiltonian. Uh, whereas in an interacting system, you would have to, I guess, look at the Green's function and look for discontinuities. Uh, so we decided for this project to just restrict to free fermion systems. And then we can use this formalism of uh, Gaussian fermionic maps, which I think was first described in this paper by Christina Krauss um, in 2010. And so the way to work with these is, is well, the standard way of working with these is somewhat different. I will I have a, a brief uh, explanation of what is on the, on the next slide. Uh, but well, the important thing um, is, is of course that this is not a different class of states. Uh, you can you can convert um, these Gaussian states into into uh, well exact maps with with tensors in one of the following forms that you could then put on the computer um, and and maybe perturb to include interaction and these kind of things. Uh, so certainly one part of the motivation is well if you have already a good uh, description even of an interacting system, not that we're going to talk about this today, but if you have a good Gaussian description using Gaussian fermionic maps, you could use this as an initial state to uh, to, to start your PEPS optimization, your interacting fermionic PEPS optimization starting from this state. So how do how do uh, how does um, fermionic PEPS and, and well in particular this Gaussian fermionic PEPS work? So the um, this, the philosophy behind the construction of the state is the same. You start from entangled pairs of virtual degrees of freedom, um, and then you apply some projector to a physical state on the virtual degrees of freedom associated with one site. Um, in this case, these virtual degrees of freedom uh, will be fermions, uh, but it actually turns out that um, a fermion is, in this case, not the smallest unit um, the smallest quantity that you can use as a, as a virtual degree of freedom, you can actually just use a Majorana mode, uh, which would um, in some sense amount, so if this virtual bond would be an entangled state of two Majorana modes, in some sense this would uh, amount to a bond dimension of square root of two. Um, in practice, if you want to build an actual tensor out of this, you will still actually need um, two dimensional bond dimension, but then you would be able to Truncate this, for example, in the double layer, these two times uh, on dimension two, you would actually be able to reduce them back to uh, just in the double layer to a single bond dimension two. So it is actually true to think of a Majorana bond as a square root of two bond dimension. Um, and if you have several of them, and I think that's on the next slide, um, if you have chi one of these virtual Majoranas in, in, in the horizontal direction, chi two in the vertical direction. This means you would have a bond dimension square root of two chi one, um, or just two to the power chi one over two. If you want to build an actual tensor, you would have to round this to the next, um, well, chi one over two has, so it has to be rounded uh, to an integer. So um, what does this Gaussian formalism um, well, what does it imply for the, the state? So we will uh, work, we will restrict to translation invariant systems and work in Fourier space. Uh, and of course, a Gaussian state is completely described in, ter in terms of its covariance matrices. Um, well, we will work with Fourier transformed covariance matrices. So there is a covariance matrix associated with the input state, which is this, this the state of these virtual degrees of freedom, um, which as just a very well, standard form. Um, and then applying the projection is, is, is um, captured by um, 
well, this transformation formula in terms of three parameters and this and this matrix is A, B, and D and C. I forgot to uh, to put the, their their size here, but uh, it's not all that relevant. And so this gives you some this gives you basically the the correlation matrix um, of the physical degrees of freedom uh, in momentum space. Um, so as I said, we will start by just uh, applying this formalism in, in 1D uh, to the kitayev majorana chain, um, of which you have the phase di diagram here. So um, there are, um, well, there's a chemical potential term and a nearest neighbor pairing term, superconducting term. Um, for mu between um, minus two and two, times uh, the hopping strength um, and non-zero delta, there are, there is a topological phase uh, in which in particular there is um, this um, RG fixed point of nearest neighbor entangled Majorana pairs, which in a sense is what we are using as virtual, as input state for the virtual degrees of freedom. Um, and so this means that in, in well, in this part of the phase in, in the gaps, there is a particular point, I guess, for delta equals two times t, I'm not entirely sure, and mu equals zero, uh, which has an exact MPS representation with chi equals one. So that's not the one that we will look at. Uh, we study four points, so two in the gapped phases, one in the topological phase, one in the trivial phase, and then the black lines are the critical lines. Uh, so there is a phase transition between two topological phases. There is a phase transition from topological to trivial. So these are the reds and the yellow points. Um, and what you see is that, um, so there are, uh, this, is a, this is a plot as a, of the error in the energy density as a function of, of uh, bond dimension, but of course it's in terms of this, the sky, this number of virtual uh, Majorana modes that we're using uh, in, in the MPS. Um, but there are two types of lines. There is uh, the full lines use an even number of Maior virtual Majorana modes. The dashed lines use an odd number of virtual Majorana modes. Um, and then if we look at, um, okay, and then I think I reversed probably uh, even and if I now look at it. Um, yes, because the blue point, which is in the topological phase, uh, it turns out that uh, it's in a gapped phase. So the energy goes, uh, the, the error in the energy goes down very quickly, but actually only uh, goes down very quickly if you use an odd number of chi. So notice this odd and even here uh, should be um, reversed. So full is odd. Um, dash is even. Uh, so if indeed um, you use an even number of, of uh, uh, sorry, an odd number of Majorana modes, this error goes down very quickly. And I guess once below 10 to the minus eight, um, the way this was optimized, so you can actually work with this Gaussian formalism and these Fourier transforms directly in the thermodynamic limit in 1D. Um, but um, well, I think below 10 to the minus eight, this will probably go down even further, but the optimization algorithm and the way of calculating these quantities was, was maybe had some, some numerical inaccuracies. Um, so for the purple point in the trivial gapped phase, it's more or less the same story, except that you have to reverse, or well, you have to use in that case, um, an even number of uh, virtual Majorana modes. Um, for the yellow dot, so the phase transition between topological and trivial, um, it doesn't quite matter whether you use an even or an odd number, it just goes down monotonously. Um, and for the red points, which is really just uh, mu equals zero, delta equals zero, so it's really just free fermions hopping. Um, there, in fact, it also matters. There you also want to use an odd number of virtual Majoranas and, um, an even number of virtual Majoranas, it, it doesn't seem to work. Um, the rate at which these, um, these curves go down seems to be exponential. Um, the yellow one goes down a bit more quickly, but uh, I guess we can understand 
uh, based on the fact that this phase transition is essentially an easing type phase transition. So it's uh, C equal one half. Whereas this point, just three fermions hopping on the lattice, is like the XX model, um, which is in a way two copies of the Ising model, and which has uh, central charge one in its uh, CFT description. So this all seems to be what we expect. The fact that in the topological phase, we want to use an odd number of Majorana modes is not that surprising, given that indeed this phase contains um, this particular point where you have an exact description using um, a single virtual Majorana, which is an actually the physical one. Uh, so where the projection acts, acts trivially. Um, and that in the trivial phase, we want an even number of Majoranas. Well, given that in particular for delta equals zero, um, the ground state here is just the, the trivial vacuum, the trivial empty state or the trivial filled state, um, which is just the product state with zero virtual fermions. So this is not very surprising, but it is uh, kind of intriguing that, um, that our optimization algorithm does not seem to uh, to work in these two respective phases. If you choose, if you make the wrong choice in terms of uh, virtual uh, number of virtual Majoranas, um, we know that in principle this shouldn't matter. If you have, you can always you should be able to just decouple one of these virtual Majoranas. Uh, and so even if you've chosen an even number and you want to describe a state which requires an odd number, you should just be able to decouple one virtual uh, Majorana. But that's a bit like working with a non-injective MPS. Um, and so typically a numerical optimization algorithm that starts from some random states uh, doesn't seem to find these kind of, these kind of things. Um, okay, is this um, clear for everyone? Um, if there are no questions at this point, then um, let's switch to 2D. Um, um, actually, I do have a question. So sure. you, do you have some intuition for why um, the, why there's such a difference between even and odd number of my runners? I mean, you just sort of presented it as this is what you find, but yes. you have some understanding for what's going on there. Absolutely. Um, and it will come uh, in a few slides. So it's uh, it's a neat intuition which we gained only after indeed observing that things um, did not work always the way we wanted it. Um, and I'm presenting it here in kind of chronological fashion of um, <laughs> how we found things, and then only afterwards started thinking why why okay. those simulations behave the way they do. Um, so in, um, well, to study the Fermi surface in 2D, we in principle just want um, this uh, free fermions hopping on the lattice at half filling. Um, again, uh, there are some natural terms which you can add to this uh, kind of two dimensional generalization of, uh, of the Majorana chain. One could say it's this P wave superconductor. Uh, but in the end, the only plot I show here is indeed exactly at this point um, where you just have the hopping model, so where mu and delta equals zero. The reason for including all the other stuff is, is again for later. Um, in this case, in two dimensions, we are not uh, able to work directly in the thermodynamic limit with, with this formalism. Um, well, because you have, you have um, and one day this really relied on, on, on having uh, just a single, it being a periodic function and a single variable. And, and, and um, whereas here, this is, this is no longer the case. So we, um, or I would say Quinton, <laughs> the simulations um, for different system sizes. So this is just linear system size. So it's uh, on a square lattice, uh, three fermions. So you can go to rather large systems. Um, and then looking as a function of one dimension, what is the error in the energy for the different system sizes? And these curves seem to uh, converge, I could say, to, um, to something which still seems to uh, improve exponent well, yes, exponentially in uh, the one dimension. Um, here is uh, 
the converse plot where we just plot for fixed bond dimensions and fixed bond dimensions in this case fixed number of chi's fixed number of uh, virtual majoranas in the horizontal and the vertical direction as a function of system size and so this kind of shows that indeed for this largest system size uh, so a thousand by thousand lattice we are essentially in the in 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 and thermodynamic limits for these values of the bond dimension. I guess the, the, the uh, system size dependence has kind of. Uh, the rate at which this goes down is, is this exponential decay that you see here. Um, so this seems to work well if you are. Um, Paying attention, you might see that these choices of um, number of Majorana modes in, in, in horizontal and vertical direction um, is maybe a bit odd. In particular, it's, it's not symmetric in the two directions. Um, and so this has a reason which indeed uh, has again to do with this choice of and the importance of choosing this right number and, and for which we have some kind of understanding. Uh, are you to just to speak, uh, you're speaking about exponential decay, but it is a lock lock plot. It looks more. Oh yes. Okay. Than... So I, need yeah, I had the same question actually. <laughs> yes. No. Indeed. That's that's a that's a very valid uh, comment. It's uh, indeed it's rather a power law uh, improvement. Yes. Thank you. Um, okay. Um, before trying to. Um, explain this just one more uh, point of reference uh, not a fermi surface but also just uh, well for benchmark purposes i could say um, an, a, a regular uh, critical point or one time dim so a zero dimensional fermi surface one could say a fermi point and actually a direct point in the churn insulator um, so this is uh, a model with now two physical fermions on every side. Um, and, and this particular form of the Hamiltonian directly in momentum space now. Um, and with one parameter delta, which has um, two chiral phases. So with uh, turn number minus one and turn number plus one. Uh, and then trivial phases uh, beyond these values of delta, which I think is delta equal two. Uh, first, the critical point between the two um, chiral phases. Uh, this is uh, a plot of, uh, well, the positive energy eigenvalue of uh, the single particle Hamiltonian. Um, so it has um, these two Dirac points uh, that you see here. Um, again, the same type of plots. So. Um, as a function of bond dimension for different system sizes and uh, the same data presented here as a function of system size to confirm that uh, we are essentially in the thermodynamic limits for what concerns these bond dimensions. Uh, here we just um, list bond dimensions. This is actually, um, well, here we use the same number of Majoranas in um, the two directions and since these bond dimensions are indeed uh, integers, it means we're using an even number of virtual Majoranas in, in both directions. So one virtual, uh, two virtual Majoranas, four virtual Majoranas, and so forth. Um, again, indeed, something that's, uh, that, well, with some goodwill, uh, you could say a power law decay, there might still be some well, there's still some it's still deviating a bit from linear behavior on this lock lock plot. Um, but it still goes down very quickly. Um, more or less the same for the other critical point. It's a bit um, a bit more erratic. Um, it still goes down very quickly. Uh, in this case, there is just one um, zero mode at uh, pi pi. Um, since my, here I had a legend, apparently I forgot this in the next plot. Um, so it's it's uh, just a real end zone. Um, so in all of these cases, it seems at least that um, by increasing the bond dimension of the PEPs, um, one is able to, uh, well, at least for the energy to, uh, to converge to the correct value. Um, 
Now, one more sample is again the Fermi surface, but now where we tune the chemical potential away from it is exactly hull filling. Um, for various reasons, we expect this to be harder. Um, well, you have an incommensurate filling. Um, but nonetheless, actually, with um, rather modest bond dimensions, so chi equal four, this means bond dimension four in one direction. Um, so it's square root, well, it's two to the power two. So with bond dimension four in both directions, um, this is very close to the exact. So here we show just uh, the filling uh, in momentum space. Uh, so the exact Fermi surface is, is indeed exactly here. You see that the filling is not very sharp. It's not from uh, exactly yellow to exactly blue in, in, in one, uh, well, from one point to the other. So there is some smooth, smoothing of this Fermi surface, which you expect at fine bond dimension. But nonetheless, this is already um, very good for, for very modest values of the bond dimension. But there is some kind of strange thing going on where here, actually very deep in the, in the positive energy region of the PON zone, all of a sudden uh, there seems to be a mode filled. And then if you do this for different values of the, num of, uh, the, the number of versatile Majoranas, um, so here they're both even, if the one in the vertical direction is odd, um, now you seem to have um, an empty mode here where the energy is, is, is very much negative. Um, the, well, interchanging X and Y gets, gives you some kind of uh, symmetric image. So the points are indeed, well, this is periodic here. It's just that indeed we, we don't plot uh, this point twice. So it's every, every region of or every point in the zone is exactly there once. Um, and then if we uh, take two times an odd number of virtual Majoranas, you get indeed these uh, empty points, which should not be there, and this filled point, which should be there, uh, which, well, which also should not be there, where it should be empty. Um, so what is happening here? Why do we see this? Why is our simulation or our optimization um, giving these kind of states with these properties? Um, and so in particular, what is the relation between the number of, of virtual Majoranas and the filling or actually uh, what turns out to be the relevant quantity is, is the parity. So our physical, the, 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 the correlation, the covariance matrix of the, of the physical degrees of freedom in momentum space uh, has this property. So normally a covariance matrix is anti-symmetric, but because you Fourier transform it, uh, it has this property. But for momenta, where, which are well equal to their, um, to their opposites, at least, in terms of the Brillouin zone, so modulo 2 pi. Um, these are known as time reversal invariant momenta. Um, even this momentum space covariance matrix could be interpreted as, as, as really the covariance matrix of, of uh, a real physical system. Um, and in particular, it, such a covariance matrix uh, at, at these values of the momenta, where it's really just, uh, I think I'm, Missing a minus sign here, right? It needs to be. Um, just anti symmetric. Um, yeah. Um, anyway, for this moment, uh, um, it makes sense to. Um, to associate, well, the, the parity at least of, of uh, at these momentum modes is well defined. So it's either plus one or minus one. Um, and well, the number of momenta in B1 zone which have this property is basically all the combinations of zero and pi in the different directions. So there are, uh, it's either zero or pi. So you have uh, two to the D, if D is the, the physical dimension of these momenta satisfying this property. And in each of these momenta in principle, the parity could be either plus one or minus one. So this gives you this uh, many different uh, distinct configurations of parity um, states that you can make. Now it turns out with this formalism of Gaussian peps, um, you can prove this, well, there is some intuitive argument um, 
where basically also the input state, so the, the state of the virtual degrees of freedom at these particular momenta um, have a well-defined parity. And you can verify for the particular, well, for the input state, what you've chosen is that if you, um, if you make a jump, if you change one of these momentum components in one direction uh, from zero to pi or the other way around, that the parity of this input state of this, this virtual starting state uh, will change with a factor minus one to the number of virtual Majoramas that you have in this direction. Um, and so you get this relation between momenta at different points. Um, and the number of possibilities that this gives is not just two to the power d, because you also have one final choice of whether the projection that you will make from the from the um, physical from the virtual state to the physical state, whether this is parity changing or parity conserving. But in the end, it means that you have in this construction of this Gaussian perhaps you have two to the d plus one possibilities for um, how the parity should look like. Um, and so if people are interested in the proof, well, it's in the paper, but uh, we can also discuss it afterwards. Um, but this means that while well, in one dimension, there is no issue, there are four possibilities. Um, but then from two dimensions onwards, uh, it seems that Gaussian perhaps cannot realize all possible um, parity configurations that you can expect in, in, in a physical state. Um, and this is indeed, we will um, return out, well, we will return to the pictures and indeed see that, that this explains what was going on in particular um, here. Um, so if basically what this tells us is that um, if uh, the number of virtual Majoranas in a certain direction is even, uh, parity cannot change if you, if you jump in P1 zone at a jump of pi. So uh, this means starting here, if you jump in the vertical direction, the number of virtual Majoranas is even, so the parity has to remain the same. If you jump in the horizontal direction, it has to remain the same. But also then from here, if you jump in the vertical direction, it has to remain the same. So this point has to have the same parity uh, and therefore here the same filling uh, as the point um, pi zero or as the point zero pi. And well, all four of these cases, you can, you can understand this way in particular, like if both are odd, it has to change every time. So you jump from here to there, it has to change. You jump from here to there, it again has to change. Um, so this is just dictated by this Gaussian Pepsi construction and seems to be an issue, an obstruction for properly describing, uh, say, a Fermi surface like this. Um, now, what is actually the physical significance of this parity, or can we relate this to um, to some other physical, physically known quantity? Um, it turns out that for gapped states, um, well, for uh, gapped fermionic states in 2D, they, well, or in, in, in any dimension, there is this, uh, for free fermions, there is this table of topological insulators and superconductors classifying all the different phases that you can have. Um, and in particular in two dimensions, um, starting from the most general free fermion Hamilton, so one which is in, uh, which has pairing terms, and so it is in this book where this single particle Hamiltonian is in this book volume of the Jean format, so where the, um, this gamma, well, contains both uh, annihil annihilation and creation operators, where it's this uh, Nambu spinner. Um, you diagonalize this, um, and then you can define a churn number based on, um, well, the negative energy eigenspace using this, um, this non abelian berry connection. Uh, and then this particular formula gives you the churn number. Actually, this is because it's using this Bohulibo design construction. Um, it's, you could call it a Majorana churn number. Um, so it tells you something about the number of Majorana edge modes. And so you might have noticed that actually in the P wave superconductor, I was using C for the churn number. And then in the churn insulator, I was using C tilde. In uh, the churn insulator, which is a state with charge conservation, uh, there, the churn number is, is really in terms of the fermionic, well, the 
multiple global degens. So just in terms of fermionic single particle um, eigenvectors. And so the relation is, is really just a factor of two. If you if you plug in the well, if you do this for a system without pairing terms, um, then the regular fermionic churn number that you would associate with, for example, with the Hall conductance uh, is just um, well, the, the churn number that you get here is twice this 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 churn number from the Hall conductance. Um, what does this have to do with these parities? Um, well, people who are uh, more familiar with this field than I am probably know this. Uh, we did not, um, but discovered that um, there is this concept of dimensional reduction. So if indeed in, um, well, in this connection, but actually in all of these momentum quantities that you have here, if you indeed just um, insert for one of the two momenta, so say for kx, you insert either zero or pi, this in a sense defines a valid momentum space description of a physical system in one dimension. So if you fix say the kx equal to zero or to pi, you get just some physical system in the y direction. Um, so if you fix kx to zero or pi, you can, uh, well, and, and, and then there is a particular um, topological quantity that you can define turn Simon's invariant. Um, which in itself is not really gauge independent. The relevant quantity is, is, is this one, the exponential of i over 2 pi times this. Um, this has to be 2 pi times i here. This is a typo. There's already a 1 over 2 pi here. This has to be a 2 pi. So what is relevant is whether this turn Simon's uh, invariant is, is uh, integer or half integer. And this is actually related to um, this Fermion disparity at the particular uh, values of ky now equal to zero or pi. So if this turn Simon's invariant is half integer, it indeed means that these two parities at uh, ky zero or pi um, are different. So that this ratio or actually this product because it's anyway plus one or minus one. Um, that this product is minus one, so that they differ. Um, if this turn Simon's invariant is an integer, um, then they are the same. But then because this term time is invariant is in fact defined in terms of this uh, original two dimension abelian uh, Berry connection, you can relate it to, um, to the churn number or at least the relation is, oh, um, what do I do now? Um, that if you look at this term uh, Simon's invariant where you plug in kx equals zero, and then uh, you plug in kx equal pi. If they are um, the same, then this implies that the churn number, um, that's a, is, that the churn number, this Majorana churn number is even. So the mod two should be around the equation, not just around the right-hand side. Um, so if the Majorana churn number is even, um, then these two, um, these two turn timers and variants are one and the same. Um, and otherwise, if it's if it's odd, then they have to differ. So in, in, in general, if the turn Simons, oh, sorry, if the Majorana turn number is even, it means that the product of those four parities has to be uh, plus one. And if it's uh, odd, then uh, it has to be minus one. And so with this constraint that we get from the PEPs with this one, you actually always get, if you just multiply all the parities, it's always even. So this seems to imply that um, with this Gaussian PEPs construction, you cannot get a churn, um, a churn Majorana churn number, which is uh, odd. Um, so I mentioned this already, so let me um, maybe go a bit quicker because time is already, uh, is already passed. Uh, so this this uh, chemical potential away from from zero. While well, we now understand what we see, why did the thing at exactly at mu equals zero at half filling? Why did this seem to work? Um, so even though that point is also surrounded by by regions which all have Majorana churn number odd, uh, and so which you should not be able to do very well with this perhaps. Um, it turns out that um, you can actually at one extra parameter, you can add some anisotropy between the two hoppings. And then this point A, 
um, skier. So there are actually regions close by where um, the turn number is well just zero. Uh, so which you can do, and this is indeed what happens. So this is actually how we also did the simulation. So how we stabilize the simulations is by starting with a slight anisotropy, where the Fermi surface rather looks like this, and indeed the parities. Uh, are not, there is no obstruction from the Gaussian Pepps construction with the spaghetti configuration. And then you, you take the limit to, well, you, you, you tune your uh, simulations to this point. Um, and so with this, uh, I've come to the, to the outlook and the conclusion. So it seems that Pepps can uh, properly capture the quantum criticality associated with, uh, well, 2D quantum criticality, both, uh, well, normal cr critical points, but also the, the physics associated with Fermi surfaces or the criticality associated with Fermi surfaces. So these do not pose intrinsic, dif intrinsic difficulties for PEPs. But what is happening is that there is some interplay with topology and Schur numbers of nearby gap phases that can lead to obstructions. Now, if you look, if you go back to these uh, papers constructing chiral PEPs from Norbert and then Nelsio and, and DJ. Uh, there are actually examples in there which have an odd Majorana churn number. And then if you start studying them, it's, what is happening is, is, is that actually these are um, cases where um, in the sure complement, this inverse um, is, well, or the determinant of this inverse is, is becoming zero. Uh, it's still the, the output covariance matrix is well defined. It's a zero over zero situation. Uh, but this gives rise to non analyticities in analyticities. Um, um, in the end, so this, well, there are indeed these, these chiral states have some, some imperfections. So they, are, they have some, some long range correlations in the bulk, which the physical chiral states do not have, uh, which are, of course, related to this, this same fact. Now, actually, it turns out so that, um, but we can discuss more about this after the start, that even. Um, for this churn insulator where the parity configuration, if I quickly go back, uh, no, I don't have plot, uh, really a plot of this, but in the end, with this churn insulator, there is no issue with the parity configuration because, well, the Majorana churn number is even. The, the Fermi churn number is one, but the Majorana churn number is two. Uh, nonetheless, even there, you also get this determinant zero uh, situations, uh, but the number of zeros in this determinant is actually, um, it's actually higher. It's like uh, the multiplicity of this of the zeros is is is, uh, is higher. So, um, and this kind of brings me to the open question: is that that uh, probably by studying other symmetries? Because here we did not impose any symmetries except from fermion parity, which always needs to be there. But for example, if you just impose charge conjugation, you can probably refine this uh, connection. You can instead of only looking at parity, you can look at that actual filling number uh, or occupation number. Uh, and, and there are similar type of relations between churn numbers and, and uh, obstructions and PEPs and therefore um, certain non-analyticities that you, that you may have. And this of course relates to this, um, this proof of Dubai and Reed where they state um, that a PEPs should not be able to describe a gapped uh, chiral phase and where they're certainly assuming analyticity is, 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 uh, is part of their their proof as far as I understand. Another interesting question is of course, how this whole story now changes uh, if you start adding interactions. And um, this is why I stressed it's important that indeed we can um, convert these Gaussian, Gaussian fermion perhaps into, into actual tensors and now start playing with them um, using our software packages, which uh, I advertised. And with this, I've come to the end. Uh, so are there any questions? So please, please, please uh, I'm, I'm sure that there must be questions. Like for the scaling of the interacting case, do you have any preliminary data? I mean, did you already try out to see if there's appears to be some scaling to show up as function of the bond dimension? No, so no, we're still in the phase of actually um, putting. Well, it, I think 
Quentin now fully understands how to do this, but we struggled for a while indeed of how, it, how to actually indeed build the correct tensors out of them, but this now seems to be under control, but we're not yet at the point of actually uh, having non-simulations of interacting systems. That's really the next step. Good question. Um, Yuto, hi Yuto, nice hi, to talk. Um, so the you you emphasize that you know there's different constructions of different ways of putting fermions in PEPs, and yes. you analyzed in terms of this Majoranic construction. So how, how does that relate to, if you go on the other path, do you encounter the same thing, but it's hidden? Or how does it work? You know, if you... you well, but, but you mean for, for these different types of constructions? Yes. Um, but I think that's a separate question. The, I mean, the construction here, um, it's just the general philosophy of a PEPs. You start with entangled states um, and, and apply of virtual degrees of freedom and apply a projection. Um, when I said there are different formulations, that's indeed how, how do you now, um, given that, that um, these virtual state, well, the physical states and also the virtual degrees of freedom are fermions, how do you um, implement this in a computer using regular tensors? Um, how do you take the fermionic statistics into account? I'm sure this particular construction of the Gaussian PEPs, you can convert it uh, to any of those formalisms that you have for, for dealing with fermions using tensors on the computer. Um, the relevant question then is of course how, well, what remains of this, of this story went once you add interactions? Um, because these parities of course, um, it is specifically to Gaussian states that these are, uh, have this well-defined notion at these, at these particular momenta. Um, so that's that's very much the open question. Once you have a general formalism that, that does, is not restricted to Gaussian states, um, what will it do? Like if you would do an optimization, um, could for example, if you try to do this Fermi surface, could, um, could the optimization choose a tensor with, with general tensors, general fermionic tensors? Um, could the uh, optimization choose to do some to, to find some kind of small interacting perturbation to get rid of this this parity obstruction? Um, that's that's uh, very much the question that we that we want to understand next. Hong Hao, you, did you have a question? Yeah, actually, I have a question. So, uh, Yoto, so regarding the firm parity uh, constraints uh, for those uh, odd number models, would yes. it be possible that we just uh, use uh, anti periodic, periodic boundary recognition to avoid uh, this time versal invariant momenta? Then the firm parity would be always be even, no? Um. Yes, you can certainly um, use different boundary conditions. If you do finite size studies, uh, you can also just restrict to an, um, an odd number of sites. Although that's already a bit more tricky because, um, so here it seems as in, in these plots, and this is also something that we still, uh, trying to understand better. So he, it looks like a single point, but of course, so these are, um, well, for finite bond dimension, my, my, my naive intuition would have been that for finite bond dimension, this is always some kind of region, some kind of smooth region. Uh, and it's actually only recently that I realized that this is not true, that the examples that you have, for example, in, 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 in the paper, um, well, it's just it's a very small bond dimension you, um, you have an example where, which has exactly parity configuration like this one without this uh, exceptional point. And if you don't study this exceptional point, 
uh, it's really a well a zero of zero over zero situation. Yes, uh, but uh, but the limit is, 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 is well defined, and so the, the size of this region is really just one point. Yeah, but uh, once we use uh, antibiotic boundary condition for both directions, then this point can be avoided. Yes, yes. Um, okay. Yeah, but so, well, I think. And um, in the PEPs, we could you, also of course, use. Came from, from trying to understand the thermodynamic limit where this shouldn't, shouldn't matter. And so I, I certainly was. Uh, but, well, you cannot do it in the thermodynamic limit. We do that in the thermodynamic case. limits, this uh, antibiotic boundary condition doesn't uh, really matter, right? At least. No, indeed, indeed. Well, um, but it's just that I was so whether you choose periodic or antiperiodic, I was just worried that if the system size is large enough, you will always be in this region. You would always have some. Um, well, so I was suspecting that this region would always have some finite size, and that therefore, for sufficiently large systems, there would always be some momenta. In this in this region where it's where it's making an error, but yeah. it's only uh, the last few days that I actually realized that, that there are fine bond dimension peps where this region is exactly just a single point. Yeah. And why are well wh whether our numerical optimization the way we do it cannot find this, or whether it's because well there are some improvements that we can make to the code to maybe deal with these points. To treat them specially, and, and and then maybe the the, the peps converts even better, and, and also in, in our in our numerical obtained peps, this would just be a single point. This this we also still have to investigate further. Yeah. Thanks. So so if I might say, I, I don't completely agree that that this anti-periodic boundary conditions cannot be dealt with in the thermodynamic limit. You could actually use different fixed points for let's say coming from the left and the right, and that might actually also solve this. But okay, let's. Uh... Yeah, but it's just the idea that momentum pi is not in 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 in, in the PUN zone if you have antiperiodic boundary conditions. Yeah, but okay, I uh, we have to check this. But there could be it could be that using different fixed points. No, but but these states have very nice thermodynamic limits, right? Uh, because they're basically they're defined in case space, right? In a continuous case space, these Gaussian fermionic peps. Yeah, but they're all gapless, no. So, which so ones? Fixed no, points not, are not no, uniquely no. defined in some sense of the of the of the transfer matrix of the. Peps. No, no, no. That's not true. No, if you if you simulate a gapped system, for instance, they're completely fine. It depends what you simulate. Yeah. Uh, I'm 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 just saying that they're constructed for a continuous prion zone, right? They're actually in some sense not. I mean, you discretize them afterwards, but they're constructed in the infinite system yes. with a yes. continuous prion zone, right? So so it seems that you can kind of trick your way around with the boundary conditions, but they won't change the inherent properties of that wave function. Uh, maybe. So, so in that sense, they should re-emerge in the thermodynamic limit, unless you divide zero by zero and, and maybe, maybe yeah. there's some either way to. But in principle, this, this is indicating, so if the determinant of this particular matrix there is zero, this is indicating that actually the norm of that state is zero, right? This, this, this well, there, there, there is a story behind that, but maybe this is uh, deterring a bit, right? But there, it is indeed true that you can construct these states and you have to put antiperiodic boundary conditions to even have a non-zero norm. My yeah. Reinhardt shade is one of the examples, right? Um, maybe you I have a simple question. So is any of these obstructions uh, present if you simulate a two-dimensional system with DMRG? So if you do, really do it, deal it as a cylinder, Mm -hmm. Or as a torus, and you would use DMRG. Is any of these, would any of these of these of these topological obstructions still kind of remain, or they are all gone? <coughs> I think they will be gone. As um, said, I, even with PEPs, if, if it was fully generic PEPs, it's not clear what what will. At least to me, maybe Norbert has better insight, but to me, it's not clear what will happen. Um, so just. Well, using generic MPS and, and DMRG, I, I, I um, using yeah, I would have to think if you like would stick to Gaussian matrix product states and and and, and then let you snake around the torus. You would have to do everything in real space, so it's a lot harder certainly to think about about all of this. But um, in DM. Sorry, yeah, but, no, uh, in DMRG, if one uh, 
don't impose translation invariance, then there's no problem, right? We could uh, target uh, odd parity sector because Gaussian maps can change from parity. Yeah. Well, I, I think on a cylinder, you will still have a connection between the, the, the K points, right? In the translation in that direction. Like, like the, the, the parity change in, in the K direction must, be, must still be the same. Yes, but uh, in DMRG, one, one of the direction is open, so there's no problem. Mm. At least one could target uh, ground states with odd permanent parity without any problem. Unless one uses uh, translational invariant uh, MPS and with a Gaussian map, then there would be a problem because of the firm parity issue. Exactly. It's, 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 it's about yeah. indeed Gaussian maps where you have translation invariance in one direction, right? I, I mean, one, once you break all translational symmetries, there's no issue. Yes. I guess the question is what happens when you put a, a, a Gaussian MPS on a cylinder and then you repeat it. So you have A, B, C, D, E, yeah. A, B, C, D, E, and so on. Yeah. which I guess is a typical thing done when you do the simulations on, a, a, a common thing done at least when you do the simulations on cylinders. In IDMRG, yeah. But yeah, for finite size, DMRG, there's no, no, no finite size, I, I don't no, think no. finite size will have any problems, right? Once you break translation symmetry, I think all these obstructions. Yeah. I mean, I mean the, whole, the whole point of case space is gone in some sense once you break translation symmetry, right? Okay, so that's another kind of indication why Steve did everything right. <laughs> Maybe on that note, we can end the official part. And um... can I ask something uh, different? Oh, sure, sure. sure. So, uh, yeah. can you go back to your scaling to your scaling plots? Uh, um, so here, for example, uh, there is no. So there is no. Rescaling with respect to L. So is it the is it the intensive energy here? I'm sorry, can you repeat? Look. Yeah, sorry, it's a bit noisy here. So uh, what I what this delta E is the intensive energy that you are plotting. So the energy per yes, uh, it's the error and the energy density. Yes, energy density because you would still expect some kind of a finite size correction to that, right? Something like minus one over L square or L cube. Uh, no, I don't know exactly. So with respect to the thermodynamic limits. So, I mean, even if you had infinite D, there should be some uh, L effect, right? So this curve, why do this curve go one on top of the other? So that, that's my question. Well, so why would you expect it? It's not- These curves are all different bond dimension, no? So this so yes, to... But I was, I was wondering why the L equal 200 is on the top of the L equal 1000. Uh, maybe maybe to make it, to, to look, look, at, look at, to make a comment in, in this specific scenario, the convergence I'm pretty sure is exponential in the system size. Okay. Then, uh... because, because basically you're trying to approximate the integral over the um, dispersion by a discrete sum over the dispersion. And, and one of the magic things is if you, if, if you replace an integral by a discrete sum and you have a periodic function, the error goes to zero exponentially in the step size, like in the, the lemma spacing. But this argument doesn't work. So the same is in 1D, right? But in 1D, I'm pretty sure that this, there is a power law. because For free fermions? Yes. Free fermions? Yes. So if, it, if you are at the critical point, right? so. Yeah, yeah, the critical point, well. But you mean, but you mean? The, this, the these are, thing, no? but these are errors just of how much does a numerical simulation differ from the exact energy for that system size, right? It's not the error with respect to the energy density and the well, I guess ah, Lucas okay. talking about the energy as a function of system size, right? You have like finite size corrections. Okay. Yes, yes exactly. Exactly. Density. So, okay. I thought, okay. Okay. Now I understand. So you're, you're subtracting the exact energy at finite L. Yes. Okay. Yes, exactly. Okay. And then okay, we so divide that by the system size. Okay. So this is uh, unclear to me how we should yeah. work here. No, but I think for a gapped system in this specific scenario, the correction will be exponentially small in the system size that the finance. Oh, yeah, yes, certainly. For gapped, no. yeah, but this is critical, right? Yes. Oh. There is, you are in this linear dispersion. Right? But, um, okay, but, but then. Oh, that's a different um, These so corrections the will also question. be so, contained in the exact solution, right? So that will. Yes, indeed, indeed. Uh, 
that this is the second way. So the, from this plot, what do you interpret? Is it D relevant or irrelevant from the RG point of view? Because it looks like irrelevant from your, your plots, right? I'm not sure if I'm saying, I mean, finite bond dimension introduces a finite length scale that's always irrelevant for two basic, right? But this is, so this is, we, we were not aiming for a collapse here. We, we, this is not, this is not yeah, really, exactly, I mean, I, 